there's been a strange phenomenon sweeping central Germany. While the true extent of its influence is still unknown, it seems to have been going on for quite some time now, usually in irregular intervals. If you were to head down to any of the towns within the affected region for a visit, the chances of you noticing anything out of the ordinary would still be rather low. But then again, if you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, it's entirely possible you could witness an occurrence of SCP-3023, every arachnophobe's worst nightmare. One terrifying incident happened at a baseball game held during the height of the summer. With the scorching sun hanging high above a stadium packed with eager fans, the home team was neck and neck with their longtime rivals from the next town over. As the players took to the field after a changeover, everything hung in the balance. The home team's coach had made a bold change, sending out a new baseman, a young man named Jenik Denke. He was a rookie, untested, but the team's strongest veterans had been doing their best through the whole first half of the game, and still, the scores were almost tied. And so Janik stepped up to the base, unaware that making the next catch would change his life forever. The crowd was silent, the tensions flattening their cheers and chants to a low murmur as the rival's heaviest hitter stepped up to the bat. He was a behemoth. Arms twice the size of the baseball bat he carried over his broad shoulder, striding up with confidence as he readied a swing. Watching and waiting, a bead of sweat rolled down Janik's forehead, dropping down the bridge of his nose. He couldn't tell which was making him sweat more, the heat of the sun or his own nerves. His teammate at the pitcher's mound lifted a leg, the baseball in hand. If he gripped the ball any tighter, his fingernails might have splintered and got lodged in the white synthetic leather wrapped around it. Janik stared, not even bothering to wipe away the drops of sweat in his eyes. As his teammate's throwing arm reeled back and hurled the ball forward, it felt like time itself had slowed down. The rival team's batter swatted the baseball out of the air with an earth-shattering crack that sent the ball speeding through the air. Janik dashed to catch it, his mitt outstretched. The ball was careening back down to earth like a white and red meteorite almost moving fast enough to burn up on re-entry as it hurled through the atmosphere. Janik could feel his heart rattling against his ribcage as every instinct told him he'd never make that fateful catch. In a final act of desperation, he leaped off the ground with every ounce of strength and all around him the crowd exploded with the thunderous sounds of overjoyed applause. The mighty force of the weighty cork ball was like catching a punch in midair, the tremors of the impact rippling down Janik's arm. He felt that first, before realizing that the ball was now lodged securely in his hand. He'd done it. He'd made the catch. The batter was out. But before he could even react in celebration, it <laughs> happened. His arm recovered from the initial shock of the catch just in time to feel the lightning-fast flurry of small legs scuttling over his skin. Barely able to catch his breath, the last thing Janik saw was something that used to be the baseball, hurriedly crawling up his chest towards his neck. From a distance, his teammates, the fans in the audience, only saw him drop to the turf, flailing his arms trying to brush off something crawling over him as it attacked and killed the young baseman in what otherwise would have been the proudest moment of his life. While that might have been the first time anything like that had ever happened, it certainly wouldn't be the last. Now, have you ever passed by an abandoned building and felt an urge to look around inside? Of course, a lot of us have. But most of us are smart enough to resist the urge. But on the very rare times you and your friends have worked up the courage to explore somewhere like this, you've probably never found anything all that interesting. Then again, you might want to think twice before sneaking past those keep out and condemn signs. Maxie and Iva learned that lesson the hard way when they gained access to an abandoned office block. Maybe they were trying their hand at making a Blair Witch Project style amateur found footage movie, or they could have been dabbling in some urban exploration. Best case, there might have been a few places of office furniture left behind by the building's previous occupants, something that the removal company forgot to take when the place was cleared out. The pair of them could have just helped themselves. After all, they needed a new folding chair for their apartment, and there was one just sitting there. Trembling through her stifled tears, Iva's phone was shuddering in her hand. The office had been dark, 
but she was certain the shadowy shape that had taken Maxie didn't belong to a human being. Clamping her hand over her mouth to silence her terrified breaths, she peered out from under the desk, pointing her phone's camera wherever she looked as it recorded. Iva could hear the loud tapping of several metal legs, moving hurriedly around the empty office. The noise would pause at irregular intervals. Every time it stopped, she thought, no, prayed that the creature was gone. But just as Iva went to look, she would hear the same sound, quick, scampering steps, the kind of movements that feel unnatural to look at, that are only possible for things with eight legs. Perhaps that made it worse. The creature didn't shriek or scream or breathe like you'd expect of some awful monster in a horror movie. But then again, how could it? It had been a chair when Maxie had walked up to it, nothing more than an ordinary folding chair. The patter of metal footsteps stopped again, this time for longer. It had to be gone now, she thought. She gave it another few seconds just to make sure the silence wasn't broken again. Crawling out from under the desk, her phone still in her hand, Iva allowed herself to breathe a tentative sigh, only for that sigh to become a scream as it lunged at her. The chair's seat and back, now the body and maw of an angry arachnid monster. As Iva screamed, her phone caught the whole gruesome sight on camera. You might be starting to see a pattern emerging here. But there's yet another twist in this multi-legged tale. What if these occurrences weren't just random incidents? Sure, they might fall into the freak of nature category like so many other anomalous incidents, but while it's unclear exactly how these particular anomalies come about, could it be possible that something, or someone, is creating them on purpose? Mobile Task Force Alpha-21 were already on the scene in the aftermath of the latest incursion. The Elite Foundation strike team had eliminated the threat. Luckily, it had started life as a phone, meaning they were able to remotely destroy it, causing its electronic components to detonate. Not before it had killed two Foundation personnel, though. Naturally, now came the cleanup operation, gathering up evidence leaving no trace of what had happened. The SCP Foundation still had little clue as to what exactly caused instances of this nature, a phenomenon they had now designated as SCP-3023. All they had to go on was a handful of cases, and footage recovered from a cell phone that had belonged to an urban explorer who'd met an untimely end at the jaws of a folding chair. But speaking of footage, something unusual had been caught by a security camera a few days before the latest SCP-3023 incident. The security footage showed a man breaking into an office where the latest 3023 instance, the telephone, had been found. As he picked up the phone in question, this individual's jaw appeared to unnaturally split open horizontally, allowing four dark, tongue-like appendages to emerge. These appendages rubbed the phone for over half a minute before retracting. The man then returned the phone to its original place and promptly left the office. Thanks to further investigations conducted by the Foundation's forensic experts, this unknown individual was identified as Mr. Sar, the owner of a local restaurant. Naturally, MTF Alpha 21 moved in to apprehend this suspect, the only real lead as to what has been causing the multiple instances of SCP-3023 to begin occurring in Germany. However, when Sar was eventually detained, he showed next to no sign of any anomalies in his body. He claimed to have no memory of the events depicted in the security footage, had never encountered any previous SCP-3023 instance, and seemed to possess no knowledge of the strange properties he exhibited on camera. Nonetheless, the SCP Foundation was forced to detain Mr. Sar, although he never displayed any anomalous behavior ever again. Now, you might be forgiven for thinking that, with Soror held in Foundation custody, everyone could breathe a sigh of relief. But sadly, for any arachnophobes watching at home, new instances of SCP-3023 kept cropping up, in even stranger and more horrific fashion than ever before. Imagine you had a headache, and we're talking about a real killer here. One of those power drill to the frontal lobe migraines. Maybe you'd spend too much time glued to a computer screen at work, and all that blue light from your monitor scrambled your gray matter. Or perhaps last night was a pretty wild one, and after a few too many drinks, you were left feeling hung over the next morning. What's your go-to response in that situation? Obviously, you can call in sick to work, then go to your medicine cabinet or an over-the-counter pharmacy and grab some basic painkillers. Paracetamol, aspirin, ibuprofen, all the things that we trust to make us feel better not to make things even worse. To Patrick, this started as one of the most normal things in the world. 
like you or I, his immediate response to finding himself suffering from a raging headache was to grab a gelatin capsule of ibuprofen. As casually and unsuspectingly as anyone would, he took the pill in hopes of quickly relieving his pain and carrying on with his day, probably even chasing it down with a quick glass of water. Only unbeknownst and unseen to Patrick, something happened the moment that ibuprofen capsule passed through his lips and went towards his throat. Something that stopped it from fully going down his throat, in fact. Much like the baseball, the folding chair, the phone, and who knows how many other unrecorded incidents, the pill had sprouted eight spider-like legs. At first, it started as a gentle cough, like you'd expect when a capsule gets lodged in your throat. Grabbing a tissue, Patrick gave a few grunting attempts at clearing his airway. There was definitely something in there that almost felt like it was scratching. Not the kind of scratch at the back of the throat brought on by some allergies, the kind of scratching that caused Patrick to cough up blood when he put a tissue to his mouth, the kind of scratching that he could feel moving, crawling around his windpipe. Perhaps if he had more time, Patrick could have raced to the hospital and had whatever was clawing its way around his throat removed safely with that free European healthcare. Unfortunately, the thing that the capsule had turned into just as he swallowed it wasn't that kind. Racked with unimaginable pain, Patrick was writhing and spluttering uncontrollably, his mouth filled with more bile and blood than saliva at that point. The scratching was moving, and not down towards his esophagus towards his stomach. It was going outwards, burrowing through the insides of his neck until it reached his spinal cord. By that time, the little ibuprofen capsule-sized instance of SCP-3023 came crawling out from the back of his neck. Patrick was already dead. Let's say you were aware of this, of all these strange happenings, seemingly ordinary everyday objects turning into angry, aggressive spiders. Obviously, the Foundation might want to have a little chat with you about how you came across such information, but for the sake of argument, imagine you did know. You might think the smart idea would be to leave. After all, SCP-3023 instances are only known to occur in a specific region of central Germany, neatly situated in the middle of Leipzig and Dusseldorf. So you might think that it's time to up sticks and leave that area, maybe even leave Germany altogether. Just hop in your car and drive to safety, if only it were that easy. A family of four was cruising down the Autobahn in an SUV, just another car on the packed highway. Exhausted after hours on the road, Matteo and Nina sat quietly up front, making sure they didn't wake their son and daughter, both asleep in the rear passenger seats. The car was picking up speed, about to pass 70 miles per hour as it gradually carried them home, although it wasn't going to get them all the way back. The screech of twisting metal woke both sleeping kids up screaming, their parents equally shocked at the sudden noise. The car lurched and buckled, like something had collided with it. But this was no ordinary traffic accident. Without any rhyme or reason, the front of their SUV warped itself into the distinctive shape of a cephalothorax, while the rear turned into what looked like an abdomen. As the car shifted and reshaped around them, the grinding of metal as auto parts became huge metal legs. Matteo, Nina, and their children were still trapped inside, never to make it out. But the creepy crawly carnage wasn't just contained inside the car. The newly born arachnid abomination hurtled its way down the autobahn, managing to maintain its speed. Other drivers swerved and slammed on their brakes to avoid hitting the creature they couldn't even believe was scuttling hurriedly along the highway. Unfortunately, this led them to careening into other cars, smashing headfirst into a pileup that claimed the lives of 41 people. Not that the SCP Foundation would ever admit it. With one of their facilities only 250 meters away, they were quick to dispatch an airstrike to deal with the spidery SUV once it became clear that Mobile Task Force Alpha 21 couldn't contain it. Across the board, anything capable of sprouting four pairs of spindly legs and crawling towards you with the intent to kill tends to rack up quite the body count, but dealing with bodies are some people's business. That was the case for Lucas, a newly qualified coroner. After passing years of training, he was working with the local police department, performing autopsies and examining bodies to help them with their investigations. Sure, it may not have been the most glamorous profession, but Lucas could sleep soundly, knowing that he'd never get hurt by a dead body. A John Doe, a body that hadn't yet been identified, had just been brought in after police had found him on the side of the road. Lucas thoroughly washed his hands, put on his gloves and scrubs, along with the rest of the autopsy team. 
He'd sat in on at least a dozen of these procedures, studied the relevant process and techniques. Everything had prepared him for the job of figuring out how someone had died. But not even the most experienced medical examiner could be prepared for what happened next. Taking the lead, Lucas began by making the primary incision into the cadaver's chest. It always reminded him of a particular scene in The Thing, where a character's stomach opened up and became a maw of frightening teeth, revealing them to be the titular shape-shifting alien. That thought was quickly shaken away when suddenly, to Lucas's surprise, the body lurched violently on the examining table. Not everyone expects dead bodies to be able to move, and while it might be rare, it's also not impossible. Any number of things can cause someone's remains to move after death, muscles atrophying or spasming, the body filling up with gas as it breaks down. Of course, any coroner would expect these movements to have subsided by the time someone reaches the autopsy room. Caught off guard by the sudden violent movement, Lucas stepped away, dropping his scalpel. His panting breath warmed his face beneath his surgical mask as he stared for a moment, waiting to see if the body moved again. Certain it would be still now, Lucas wrote the spooky incident off just as a muscle spasm and leaned over to retrieve his scalpel. But while he was crouching, he noticed something strange. It almost looked as if there were a pair of protrusions poking out from under the dead man's skin. Walking around the other side of the table, Lucas found two more similar lumps at the body's abdomen, almost as if something was inside, ready to force its way out. Without warning, the John Doe suddenly moved again on the examining table, only this time, it didn't stop. Lucas couldn't believe his eyes. The man's face was still, frozen in the same dead expression, but his arms and legs were thrashing and writhing around as if he was somehow still alive. Four extra limbs suddenly burst from the sides of the cadaver, and the now eight-legged creature reared itself up, leaping towards a member of the autopsy team. It scuttled and skittered around on its new appendages while Lucas watched in horror. Blood-curdling screams filled the autopsy room as he bolted for the door. Lucas raced down the corridor. The coroner dared not looking behind him while sprinting through the city mortuary. Behind him, he could hear the thudding of the spider's multiple limbs right at his heels. Out of the corner of his eyes, right on the edge of his peripheral vision, he could see the mass of legs scuttling towards him. Maybe he would get out, run all the way to safety before the spider was upon him. But how can you hope to outrun something with eight legs when you only have two? The most important thing to remember is that while any unsuspecting inanimate object near you might suddenly decide to become an angry spider, the chances of it happening are very, very low. But especially if you happen to be in central Germany, those chances are never zero either. Now go and check out SCP-2086 Man-Eating Bus and SCP-1562 The Carnivorous Slide for more tales of everyday objects that are far more sinister than they first seem.